what we have today is sort of a, a small taste of what Sam has done, but with a larger number of people. And I want to start out by talking about something slightly broader even, which is this notion of what we refer to as the two cultures. So there was a Reed, Reed lecturer, C.P. Snow, in 1959, who had worked both as a research chemist and as a novelist. And he wrote about this, what he called mutual, the gulf of mutual incomprehension between the artistic and the literary communities and the scientific communities. And he suggested that this might be particularly bad in England because of their early tracking system, but that it was true all over the planet, that a scientist in the UK had more in common with somebody who was a fellow scientist, say, in Boston and MIT, than they did with the person just down the hall from them who was in, say, an English literature department. Um, and one of the things that I've always really loved about the study of synesthesia and about the ASA and other organizations like this is that it's really been embracing both of these two cultures. That it is a, it's an attempt to create a group of people who understand synesthesia, both at this artistic level of being able to try and convey what it's like, people who use it every day in their creative practice, and also who understand what's happening at the brain level. Now, I'm never going to be as great a painter as Carol, but I can appreciate how she comes to do this. And Carol has, over the years, learned to speak some of the neuroscience jargon that I spend my days thinking about. <laughs> Much to her chagrin. <laughs> um, but of course, this type of interdisciplinary project, this type of synthesis, requires that we find these middle grounds, these sort of compromises between what the scientists, scientists might want in terms of rigor and control, what artists might want in terms of creative outlets. And today, I think, is actually a great example of just that. So we had a group of musicians, a group of artists, who were all working together to try and find ways to convey this. And for the musicians and the artists, I'm sure today was frustrating because they had to play the same pieces over and over again in ways that are much more constrained than they might do if they were actually trying to put on a performance. For the artists, I know that the color palettes that we had, I know that the materials, I know that the whole range of different things that we can provide at a workshop like this is going to be limited and you're never going to be able to exactly capture what it's like. For the scientists, this is massively under constrained. It's not controlled in the ways that we typically would design our studies. And yet, this is the fertile ground. This is the exact area that we need to be stretching ourselves into to do this sort of work. And this is where what Sam and Jamie have done to put together this film, where things like the ASA and a meeting like this is really powerful and really important, is building these bridges so that people can understand, hey, why is it that you brain scientists would care about this particular thing? Why is it that an animator would spend the amount of time that you do to get these exactly right? And I think that that's exactly what we were trying to do today. Um, and so I'll t say just a little bit for the people that weren't here. We had um, people from University of Toronto's Griffin Trio and a number of their friends, um, and they performed a selection of different musical pieces. Some of them were shorter, very simple things, to try and get at the types of contrast, say the same notes of different timbres, these sorts of things. They were shorter, more controlled. Other ones went all the way to full musical pieces. And we asked synesthetes and non-synesthetes to share their responses to the music with us by drawing, painting. Some people had threads. They tried a variety of different media to be able to convey what it was that they were experiencing. And as I said, I'm sure that this is incomplete for everybody. So um, it's only a hint at what it might be like. Um, and we literally finished this up at 4.30, um, actually closer to 5, and so we've had just a couple of hours to even grab all of this stuff and try and put it together here. So we focused only on the synesthetes. And I'll show you just a couple of examples. So here we had a piece where there were four rising tones. Um, is Stephanie in the audience? I'm Stephanie, I'm still afraid that we've got this upside down. No, it's right. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> So Carol described earlier today an experience of getting it upside down, and I was sure that we were going to replicate that experience. <laughs> but you can see. And these were 
were, these were four visualizations that we selected in response to that piece. And um, you can see that there's some commonality across them, and you can also see some differences. So what's the first thing that jumps out to everybody? What do you see? Yeah. It goes up across the page. It goes up across the page. What else did I hear? Fight. They're in sets. The, the angle, so the, the angle may differ across the different people. Left to right. They all seem to go left to right. Yeah, which might have something to do with our Western culture. Um, one thing that I didn't mention to you guys, so all of the people that we have these drawings from on the slides today are synesthetes, but not all of them report having synesthesia for music. So this gets a little bit back at what Sam was talking about in terms of this continuum. But this simple sort of story of, hey, look, there's this mapping, and we can start to perhaps uncover some of the principles that make this work, is not quite as simple as it might at first appear. So Carol's painting here um, does not have that four separate pieces and does not necessarily have that mapping of left to right, where each of the different chords is being um, very clearly delineated here. Dim the lights. Dim the lights? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll show you guys this. Now, these are all scanned in um, fairly quickly, so they're not as high contrast and as clean as they could be, but they still give you some insight into what the participants in the workshop today were doing. And then here's one more that, again, sort of illustrates that it's not always um, as clear cut as the ones that we saw before. Um, moving on, I'll show you guys another one. Here we had a violin versus a cello. So the same piece, but um, done with these two different instruments. visualization now maps on to the things that you've heard. Does this seem appropriate? I hear some yeses, I hear some noes. Credit, credit, you did not. Here's a couple of others. Here's a couple of others that also perhaps capture some of this. Um, this one may be upside down. Yeah. Yeah, so different pieces we had more or less time to do. So you can see one person in the short amount of time that they had were able to do a fair bit. Um, and you can see a lot of the oranges and the yellows here. Um, here, this one has no color at all. You can see that this is all just black. This one does have some browns and some yellows in there as well. And then this is a... Another one that uh, was also done, and you can see here, the A, the violin is on the left, and the B, the cello, is on the right there. So we can start to notice some patterns here in terms of the choice of colors that are used. Um, perhaps slight differences, but across a lot of this, there seems to be for the string instruments, a preference for these yellows, these oranges, these sort of warmer colors, perhaps. Um, even here where we don't see as much of the color palette being used, we definitely can see that. There's a hint here 
two of either a blue, or I think it's blue being used in there. So um, there's, there's more that's being used in here. Um, and then you can see here perhaps a slightly different color palette being selected here. And then one of our last ones um, we had, and here I just wanted to show you guys a few of the um, beautiful visualizations that people developed to Riverman by Nick Drake. And this was the full song was being played and various different people were demonstrating what they were seeing in response to this. And again, if I've got one of your visualizations upside down, please just come slap me afterwards. Um, but this one, um, and you can see here a very different color palette. Um, and then this one here. So um, this gives you some sense of the things that the participants in the workshop today generated in response to these pieces. And we're still working through the patterns, trying to make sense of what things can we get at here in terms of the qualitatively observable properties, the principles. So things that you guys can yourself see, the left or right orientation, pitch, height, mapping onto height on the page, but things that might be more complex as well in terms of, for example, um, here is it perhaps more staccato. So you see here these continuous forms versus a more dotted form. This one, the same sort of thing, the same thing here. How quantify that? How do we actually, as scientists, try and move from um, the types of things that we had um, observed when we just look at these to actually coming up with a metric that we can share with our other scientific colleagues and try and convey this. But um, I thought today was a very valuable um, entry into this point. And it's worth mentioning that so much of synesthesia research for the past decade has focused on graphene color synesthesia, thinking about the origins of letters and numbers having colors. Um, and some of that is part of, partially because we know so much about how the visual system works and how to try and approach that from a cognitive psychology and from a neuroscience perspective. Some of that is also because that type of synesthesia just seems to be more common. Um, but there are important principles about synesthesia that we ignore if we focus exclusively on graphene color synesthesia. So I think things like this are really a step forward in trying to get a better understanding on the rich variety of synesthetic experiences and trying to have a better understanding of what it means to be a synesthete. So um, with that, uh, I'll open it up for questions and um, perhaps some of the other people that are also part of the um, organization would like to add their two cents.